Good day, dear great surgeons, with you all. Let's all discuss today the post-operative chapter and its overlapping with the perioperative and the surgical skill. It's a very important chapter in your life and the MRCS exam. Again, you will find your MRCS exam as it's if a uh, not surgical exam at all, but an orthopedic trauma and post-operative and pre-operative chapter overlapping with the anatomy, of course. So keep this in mind and let's go for it together. Together we can. This is great session. Take care. It's very important to know that a long term ventilation will require eventually tracheostomy to maintain the airway. Because if a patient for long term, more than for example one month, and requires ventilation mechanically, he can't be dependent on the tra in, in, in the tracheal tube, but instead he will require tracheostomy. Keep this in mind. So tracheostomy reduces the work of breathing and the dead space and useful for the long term slow weaning. And by the way, the percutaneous tracheostomy is used in the intensive care unit. The only uh, prequisity is dry secretion and humidified air to be used usually required. Other option for preservation of the airway will be oropharyngeal laryngeal mask or endotracheal tubation required in certain specific situation but for long term slow weaning and require of, of mechanical ventilation tracheostomy is a must because it will reduce the work of breathing so regarding the oropharyngeal airway it's easy to insert and use no paralysis of the patient is required ideal for very short procedures most often used as a bridge to more definitive airway so you always can uh, convert from oropharyngeal airway to endotracheal intubation for example the laryngeal mask is widely used especially in pediatric patient so it's a very easy to insert uh, it sets the fangs and align to cover the airway but it has a poor control against the reflux and gastric content so take care it's not uh, not appropriate for um, a long operation commonly used as a wide range for anesthetic especially in a day surgery a very short day surgery but not suitable for high pressure ventilation if required so small amount of peep often possible and of course we have the endotracheal famous tube which provides the optimal control of the airway once the cuff is inflated and used for long and short term ventilation but take care because errors in insertion may result in esophageal intubation. Therefore, entide carbon dioxide usually measured. You will find the entide carbon dioxide always measured by the anesthesiologist. And it will require paralysis of the patient. And it very suitable for higher ventilation pressure. Unlike the laryngeal mask. So the laryngeal mask is not available and not suitable for high pressure ventilation. But the endotracheal tubation is required for high ventilation pressure. But if your patient in the intensive care and require more than three weeks or one month mechanical ventilation, consider tracheostomy to be done. And if you pay attention that the oropharyngeal airway is very common to be used in trauma and emergency to preserve the airway and prevent the patient from suctioning or swallowing his own tongue and blockage of the airway so it's a life-saving maneuver to be using the oropharyngeal airway it's very crucial to be noted it's a life-saving technique in emergency no emergency ticket without oropharyngeal airway this great surgeon take care regarding the blood transfusion problems and complications as well as the hypersensitivity reactions a very famous question regarding a patient of leukemia who had blood transfusion and here he want to know you know the complication of blood transfusion or not because he will tell you that in the fifth day after the transfusion he attended to the emergency presenting with fever at 38.5 Celsius and erythroderma as well as discomation. What is this? This is a graft versus host disease because this is associated with transfusion of unirradiated blood in immunocompromised patient. 
Again, the graft versus host disease associated with transfusion of unradiated blood in immunosuppressed patient. The transfusion is associated with graft versus host disease and can occur from the fourth to the 30 days after transfusion. So keep this in mind. So don't get confused by the day, it's irrelevant. No, it's very important. From the fourth day to the 30 days after the blood transfusion, graft versus host disease, uh, disease can occur after the transfusion and follows a subacute pathway, by the way. The patient may also have a diarrhea or even abnormal liver function test. And management will involve steroid therapy, of course, because this is an emergency. The main types of transfusion reaction. There is immune-mediated and non-immune-mediated. For example, the immune-mediated like pyrexia, aluminization, thrombocytopenia, transfusion-associated lung injury, and this is important because the transfusion-related lung injury were recognized and there are two purpose mechanisms which uh, undergoes by with it the lung injury. One involves the sequestration of the prime neutrophil within the recipient pulmonary capillary path. You will find the neutrophils and the recipient pulmonary capillary bits are sequestrated and the other mechanism of the lung injury with the blood transfusion is the HALA mismatch the HLA mismatch between the donor neutrophil and the recipient lung tissue is too plain. So again, the immune-mediated pyrexia, aluminumization, the thrombocytopenia transfusion-associated lung injury, graft versus horse disease, urticaria, acute or delayed hemolysis, ABO incompatibility, as well as the rhesus incompatibility. So all of this immune-mediated and take care because he might ask you, all of those are immune mediated except. So, the non immune mediated blood transfusion reaction will be hypocalcemia, CCF infection, and hyperkalemia. So, infection is non immune mediated, while the pyrexia is immune mediated. Hyperkalemia is non immune mediated. But urticaria, of course, immune mediated. So, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia will occur with the blood transfusion. Again, hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia. The calcium will be low, the potassium will be high. This great surgeon take care the platelets are stored at room temperature and must be used soon after collection. This places them at increased risk of culturing gram positive organism and causing even sepsis and sepsemia. So Iatrogenic infection with gram-negative organism is more likely with packed RBCs as these are stored at 4 degree. While the gram-positive is the platelet. So the platelet the gram-positive, the RBC gram-negative. Don't confuse it and keep it in mind. The infection with blood product of this nature are both rare by the way. And we all know that platelets concentrate prepared by high-speed centrifugation and administered for patients with thrombocytopenia. And remember, it's given to the patient who is undergoing splenectomy for uh, thalassemia, for example, and administered at the very moment you are clamping the vessels of the splenic vessels. Any hypersensitivity reaction can cause urticaria reaction, but take care. In MRCS exam, we are talking about the incident, infusion of which blood product will result in urticaria reaction most probably. So again, any blood product can cause urticaria reaction, but it's more common to be with fresh frozen plasma, fresh frozen plasma with urticaria reaction, while the pyrexia most common to be with the packet RPCs. So now, what is the cryoprecipitate? Cryoprecipitate is formed from fresh frozen plasma. It's a rich source, rich source for factor 8 and fibrinogen. It allows large concentration for factor 8 to be administered in a small volume. Bone well burn disease, most common inherited bleeding disorder, again von well burn disease. All von Welbrun disease is caused by mutation in the gene of von Welbrun factor, factor A. Von Welbrun factor is an adhesive 
glycoprotein that is secreted by endothelium and megakaryocyte. The von Willebrand factor promotes the platelet adhesion to damaged endothelium and other platelets. It's involved in the transport and stabilization of factor eight. <clears throat> there are seven subtypes of von Willebrand disease. The commonest is type A, type one, which is autosomal dominant, which account for 80% of cases. And type two von Willebrand is autosomal dominant or can be recessive and accounts for 15% of the cases and 5% for all the rest of the seven uh, subtypes. So again, von Willebrand disease, you have to know that it's involving factor eight and it's dominant. The common type is type one and you have to keep those ideas in mind. The test that is most typically diagnostic for von Willebrand disease is bleeding time. The treatment will include administration of tranexamic acid for minor cases, undergoing minor procedure. So if you are having minor procedure for von Willebrand disease, keep the tranexamic acid beside you. The more significant bleeding or more significant procedure respond well to DDAVB. This is most effective in type 1, less effectiveness in type 2 and contraindicated in type 2B. So keep in mind that you have transemic acid for von Willebrand in minor procedure while DDAVB for the major procedure. And by the way, von Willebrand disease can always receive factor 8 concentrate which contains von Willebrand factor. It's already found. And if you didn't found it, you can use cryoprecipitate, but more, more proper to use the von Willebrand concentrate in factor eight concentrate, which is available now on the market. This great surgeon, you have to be familiar with the inotropes. Inotropes are the power serum for your circulatory system. In patients with inadequate circulatory volume, but ongoing circulatory compromisation gives them the inotrope, but take care, the inotrope can be harmful if you give it uh, without any um, monitoring because it can exhaust the heart because it would be giving the heart and circulatory system a very powerful serum. So the commonly used inotropes are the noradrenaline, adrenaline, dopamine, dobutamine, and melanone, and usually be administered via central venous route. The noradrenaline act by being alpha agonist, and the effect will be vasopressor action with minimal effect on the cardiac output, while the adrenaline is alpha and beta receptor agonist and increases the art cardiac output and the peripheral vascular resistance. And the adrenaline is very common to be used in resuscitation, by the way. The dopamine is a beta 1 agonist, which increases the contractility and the rate while the dobutamine is beta-1 and beta-2 agonist, which increases the cardiac output and decreases the systemic vascular resistance. The medirinone, and keep it in mind that it's medi, not meta, it's medi. The introbe would be a pretty lady like meli, but meta is tough lady, so it will go harm to the heart will not give it any trope at all. Mili will give it a pretty nice push. So melirinone is phosphodiesterase inhibitor and it elevates the cyclic A and B and improves the muscular contractility, but the pretty lady will only improve the heart and cardiac contractility for a very short half-life and acts as a vasodilator. In case you forget, the dubutamine, the dubutamine has T, so it's for P, 1, and 2, while the dopamine has no T, so it has no 2. The adrenaline is very famous, and the famous gets it all, so we'll have the alpha and beta receptor, while the noradrenaline almost always forgettable, so it will have only one factor and one receptor to work on. So noradrenaline work only on alpha agonist. As a surgeon, you have to be aware of some anesthetic agent and their complication, like the toxamisonium, 
which is widely used, can cause malignant hyperthermia in a very rare situation in a patient with genetic defect. And the only solution will be a drug cause called dantrolene. So never work in a place where dantrolene is not found because dantrolene prevents the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The malignant hyperthermia is very critical issue. This condition is seen following the administration of anesthetic agent with a rate of 1 in 15,000 case. It's very rare, 1 in 15,000 case. Characterized by hyperparesia and muscle rigidity caused by the excessive release of the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of skeletal muscle. Associated with defect in gene on chromosome 19 encoding the ravionidine receptor which controls calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The causative agent common to be with the halocene, saxamisonium and other drugs like the antipsychotics which is the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The investigation to know the malignant hypersemia or the CK will be raised and the contracture test with the halocene and caffeine and again the management will be dantrolene to prevent the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic critic and by the way a very uh, famous event happened area uh, about three or four years before uh, issued the whole anesthesiology team because there were no dantrolene and malignant hypothermia occurred and the dantrolene weren't found in any place in the market in a whole country can you believe it and happened to a case and the case uh, filed an issue against the anesthesiology and the, all the anesthesiologists uh, all over the country refused to work because there were no dantrolene and malignant hyperthermia occurred for one case and it's for a genetic defect it's nobody fault so they refused to work unless dantrolene be found otherwise it's no use so they are now uh, have stood and have postponed all surgeries for a 1 in a 15,000 possibility to have malignant hyperthermia. But safety is better, so keep the dantrolene in mind. So, if the saxamisonium is very famous to cause malignant hyperthermia, keep in mind that halothane is very common to be having hepatotoxicity. And of course, let's remind that the ketamine causes dissociative disorder, hallucination, and nightmare. And the etomidae is adrenal suppressor, as well as the sodium cyobentel or sodium cyobentate is a cardiac suppressor. Let's say something good about the anesthetic agent. Why we surgeons tend to be against anesthesiologists? They are our friends. They only go to the police station instead of the surgeon. But let's say something good about the anesthesiology. So, propofol has a rapid onset of anesthesia. And by the way, it has an anti-emetic properties. So, it's important for a smooth recovery. The sodium cyobentol has an extremely rapid onset of action, making an agent of choice for rapid sequence of induction. If you want rapid sequence of induction, give sodium cyobentone. And always when we talk about the ketamine, remember Dr. House because it's used for induction of anesthesia with the strong analgesic properties that Dr. House, the drug addict Dr. House, was using the ketamine for his own pain, but always we remember that ketamine causes nightmare even for Dr. House. And etomidate has a favorite cardiac safety. So etomidate is very lovely for the heart but bad for the adrenals. I remember etomidate has no analgesic properties at all. Again we say the bad thing. So the etomidate has favorable cardiac safety. This is better things, right? A very important feature of the saxamisonium that it doesn't release histamine. This is another good thing. So the atrachium or tubocuarine or toxocarium or mivacurium, all the drugs in the tetrahydroquinolone such as the atrachium cause histamine release. Histamine release are released by all of them. By the saxamisonium and the vincrononium doesn't release the histamine. Their names are like uh, 
Harry Potter spells. I'm seeing uh, the quantum yoga. It's not a, a spell. It's a medicine. Welcome to medicine era. So after your patient recovery or during your total parental nutrition, what is the solution is needed for your patient nutrition? You will always need lipids. You will always need potassium. You will need glucose and magnesium. But in the parental nutrition, there is no need for fibers. It's not safe, even safe. Can you give him a fiber within his IV cannula? Unless you want him to get some uh, venous clogs and make him die. And by the way, we talked all about the total nutrition. Total parental nutrition is not the best route to give the patient a nutrition. It's commonly used in nutritionally compromised surgical patient. The bag contains combination of glucose, lipids, and essential electrolytes. There is a bag containing lipids and bag containing protein and glucose and electrolytes in case if you don't know. Yes, those are synthesized and given to the patient through the IV route. The exact composition is determined by the patient, individualized each patient according to his required nutrition requirement. Although it may be infused preferably, it may result in thrombophlebitis. So it's better to be directed and administered via a central vein, preferably a back line. The complication related are sepsis or even refeeding syndrome and hepatic dysfunction. Keep this in mind. And by the way, the acalcular gallbladder cholecystitis, the acalcular cholecystitis can occur with the total parental nutrition or prolonged hospitalization. Again, remember, the total parental nutrition doesn't include fiber. Take care. Take care. In parental nutrition, you have to monitor the weight daily if the fluid balance concern and otherwise weekly to reduce it to monthly and the BMI at the start of the feeding and then monthly and if the weight can't be obtained monthly mid arm circumference or triceps skin fold can be used to assess the BMI and the weight and daily electrolyte until the level are stable then once or twice a week what electrolytes you would measure and monitor the glucose, phosphate, magnesium, liver function test as well as the calcium, albumin. All of those must be kept in mind. Even the copper and, uh, and B12 as well as the folate and iron and ferritin and magnesium. All of this is very important and critical to be measured at least monthly. But every six months if the patient required to be in in um, parental nutrition for this long as long as six months so but measure the vitamin d every six months and bone densimetry done at the initiation of the parental nutrition and then every two years from all of this nutrition monitoring skills and numbers just keep in mind that the electrolytes are the mainstay important to be measured as well as the bone densimetry but there is no need to measure the thyroid function test for the parental nutrition itself. And of course, you have to consider the enteral feeding once it can be safe to be administered to the patient as early as possible. But take care from the refeeding syndrome. So be balanced and keep it in mind.